I love that song. How many, when you were singing that, thought, oh, we talked about that, and oh, we talked about that, and oh, we talked, I love that song. Trust and obey. Well, today we are going to draw to a close our eight-week study of Ecclesiastes. Who can believe it's over? Oh, my. Well, we have looked at the world through Solomon's eyes, and we have read about his misery. That's where we started in week one. And we've learned a lot of valuable lessons from the pages of this scripture. And we've looked at the, the importance of searching for the cross more than searching for the things of this world. And we've looked at the necessity of plugging into the power source, the Holy Spirit, in order to live life the way God intended. And we've learned the importance of proper behavior and choosing God's wisdom over the ways of the world. And we've seen that God gives us wisdom not only in life, but he gives us wisdom in death. And we've learned last week that it's not enough just to choose wisdom. We have to also choose to submit to those pruning shears of God to take the folly out of our life that will hinder us in living it the way that he desires. So in our closing two chapters this morning, Solomon's going to summarize what he's learned as he's looked at this life under the sun, and he's going to give some final conclusions about this life. So I've titled the lesson, Lessons for Life, and we are going to look at Three areas that life is uncertain, life is brief, and life is God-given. And as a result, we have to choose to invest, we have to choose to enjoy, and we have to choose to obey just the way that we were singing. So let's look at our first section, life is uncertain, choose to invest. And you'll look in chapter 11, we're going to look at the first six verses and as I read this, I want you to be listening to this theme of uncertainty about life. And three times in this section of scripture, Solomon is going to remind us what we do not know as well as what we cannot understand. And so with uncertainty, we're going to be asking, well, if things are so uncertain, how can I choose to invest? And that's the answer. Look at verse one, cast your bread upon the waters for after many days you will find it again give portions to seven yes to eight for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land if clouds are full of water they pour rain upon the earth whether a tree falls to the south or to the north in the place where it falls there it will lie whoever watches the wind will not plant whoever looks at the clouds will not reap as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. Sow your seed in the morning and at evening, let not your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally. So look at letter A. We need to choose to invest what you have. Choose to invest what you have. We each have been given by God talents, gifts, and time. And he asks us to invest what we have. See, Solomon, these scriptures, and I'll get specifically into them, he, he was big in the ship trade, and he would invest what he had. Well, God asks us to do the same thing, invest what we have. I want you to make note of Luke chapter 19 verses 12 through 27. Now, I don't have time to read all of that scripture, but let's just summarize it as this. This is Jesus telling the parable of the king who actually had or gave um, t uh, money to 10 servants. And he said to them, you need to go and do something. Put this money to work is what, how the scripture reads in the NIV. And then he returns and he asks them to account for what they have done with their money. And one servant says, well, I invested the money and I got back tenfold. So he doubled it and he was, um, he received approval from the king and he was given 10 cities to be in charge of. And another invested and brought back five more. And of course he was given five cities. So here's the point. 
Those who did not invest, he spoke harshly and said, what have you done? You've done nothing with what I have given you. And so the lesson to be learned there is that those who multiplied the money were rewarded and those who did not were judged harshly. We have got to invest what God has given us, whatever it is. This is not about, well, Elizabeth has this and you have this. And since I don't have what you have, I can't use what I have. You've got to use what God has given you. So let's look at some things we can learn from Solomon. The first is invest diversely. Invest diversely. Love that word. Apparently, for those of you who are into, um, you know, stocks and money, that's a word you'll hear a lot. Diversified investment. But what Solomon is saying here is you want to spread your investment out. That whole idea of giving portions to seven, yes to eight, that means rather than taking all of his grain and putting it into one ship that could be sunk by a, um, hitting an iceberg, just, you know, had to throw that in, or um, being sunk by a storm and you lose all of the cargo, spread it out over seven or eight so that if a disaster falls upon one, you've not lost your entire investment. So you want to be diversified in your investment. And in your homework, you actually studied that, putting your eggs into one basket. And don't, think, don't limit that just to money. Money, yes, but you could put all of your emotional eggs into one basket. If your husband or your children or a person is your entire life emotionally, and you don't know if tomorrow God means for that person to no longer be living. And you've invested all of your eggs into one basket. And all of a sudden, they are gone. It's emotionally devastating. And so don't just limit that to money. That applies in all areas when we're looking at how we're making an investment. Second thing we can learn from Solomon is that we must invest with patience. In verse 1, he says, cast your bread upon waters after many days. You will find it again. These ships would go out 10 months up to three years before they would return. Three years. And so the, the key here is we have to be patient. Sometimes you'll invest and you'll invest and you'll invest and it will take years. Um, there was a gal who um, led a table in Heart to Heart in the evening a couple of years ago, and I remember her sharing with me that she was sharing the good news with her um, sister. It was a family member. I think it was 15 years before that family, mem family member chose to accept Jesus Christ. 15 years of investing in prayer and modeling and sharing the truth of what God was doing in her life. We have to invest with patience. Thirdly, we have to invest wisely. That look at, you can note verse 3. If the clouds are full of water, they rain. And if the tree falls, where it falls, it will lie. So here's the key. That we don't want to ignore the conditions. Okay, so if I'm wanting to have a good hair day and I know that it looks like it's going to rain, I make sure that I carry the umbrella. Does that make sense? I don't ignore the conditions. I know that's kind of vain, but I know there are some of you out there that can relate to wanting to keep your hair looking good. <laughs> so you, want to, you don't want to ignore the conditions. You know, if you see that financially things aren't going, then you want to be careful with what you do. You don't want to ignore the conditions um, as they are. So that's one thing we want to be careful. Also, um, that whole idea of the tree falling. Listen, if a tree falls, you cannot control if it's fallen because catastrophe or we had a palm tree in our backyard. I was there. I'm not kidding. I was there working and I hear this loud noise. And that thing snapped at the base because it was dying. It snapped at the base and then snapped about eight feet higher and fell straight down in the backyard. Now, could I have controlled sitting in at my computer where that tree fell? No. And you know what? I went out and looked. I said, Fred, the tree fell in the backyard. And I thought to myself, where the tree fell is where it is. Elizabeth is not going to be moving it. So that's the idea. We have to invest wisely. Well, look at letter B. We also need to choose to invest even when conditions aren't ideal. 
Choose to invest even when conditions aren't ideal. Look at verse 4. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. The word watches indicates wait. And the word look indicates inspect. I want you to imagine someone who is literally, it's like we go outside and all we're doing is looking up at the clouds, waiting to see what will develop. Have you ever done that? You plan a trip to the beach and you see the clouds. You're like, oh, maybe we shouldn't go. It might rain. It might not be worth our trip. And so you're sitting around and you wait. You go back out. Well, they're still there. And then you never end up going. And then some of your friends go to the beach. Oh, it was great. The sun shined the whole time. And you're thinking, I wasted my entire day sitting in this house watching the clouds. Okay? So the idea is that it's that picture of someone whose time is consumed waiting for the ideal conditions. Ladies, hear me out. Waiting leads to inactivity. And that waiting is specifically when I'm waiting for ideal conditions, I'm waiting, that waiting will lead to inactivity. When the gas prices were at $3.95 and Fred and I needed to make a trip up to North Carolina, well, we could have sat there and said, well, we're not going anywhere until the gas prices fall. Well, you know what? It would have been about six months before we would have been able to go. So waiting for the ideal conditions will lead to inactivity. How many of you are inspecting all the areas of service here at the church, waiting for the ideal conditions to open up before you plug in and you serve? And so again, we have to invest even when conditions aren't ideal. The idea here is that you roll up your sleeves and you go to work. Roll up your sleeves and go to work. Ladies, we, when I was doing the homework, this is what came to my mind. We have to step out and act. Step out and act. And then trust that God will meet us with whatever conditions, be them good or bad, ideal or otherwise, that he and only he alone knows will better us and bring him greater glory. And we can get really caught up in wanting it to look good, feel good, sound good before I act. And God is saying, trust and obey and then act and let me sustain you through it. Look at letter C. Choose to invest even when we don't understand. Choose to invest even when we don't understand. Look at verse 5. You do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed. You cannot understand the work of God. Ladies, don't let what you don't know disturb what you do know. Don't let what you don't know disturb what you do know. Let me give you a practical example. All of you came from the parking lot, you walked through those glass doors, and you came in and you sat right down in a chair where you're sitting right now. And it is very highly unlikely that as you walked in, you thought, okay, but I don't know how that metal is fastened together in that chair and whether or not the seat is actually going to hold my weight and will the back hold my back when I sit down and I'm not sure if the feet are properly leveled. You did not have that conversation with yourself, more than likely. And so not knowing how the chair is put together did not disturb your reliance to sit on it. And so don't let what you don't know disturb what you do know. There are, remember, we keep saying, chapter 3, man cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. We will never know all that God is doing, all that he has done. We will not fully understand it. But we have got this verse we don't know the wind. We don't know how the body is formed. But you know what? We do know the one who harnesses the wind. And we do know the one who forms the body in the mother's womb, dispenses the rain. We know the creator God that takes care of all of those things. Let that be sufficient. We've got to remember everything is a gift of God. Everything. And so as a gift... He is saying, invest. He desires for us to invest it, even when conditions aren't ideal, so that we can demonstrate our faith 
by trusting God's sovereign control of every aspect of our lives. You know, it, it occurred to me, most people don't want to invest because they fear losing what they invest. And as I was writing that, I thought, but if everything that I have, including the very breath of my life, is a gift of God, it's not mine to lose. It's God's. And so if we keep that in proper perspective, we won't get caught up in not investing, and we will choose to invest based on God's plan. God's plan. And that leads me to our first truth. God's investment plan is make the most of every opportunity. God's investment plan is make the most of every opportunity. Jot down Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. That scripture says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise or foolish, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are are evil. In some translations, it says um, redeeming the time. Rather than making the most, it says redeem the time. That whole idea of redeem means payment of a price. To recover from the power of another. Payment of a price. To recover from the power of another. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He paid the price with his very life on a cruel cross in order to recover us from the power that sin has in our life. He redeemed us. And this past weekend, um, I had mentioned last week, you know, about those plane tickets, you know, that I had to go a day early. Well, Fred and I were in D.C. And on Saturday, we ended our sightseeing time at the World War II Memorial. And we had been at the Holocaust Museum earlier that day. And as I thought about this lesson and this particular truth about God's investment plan, it just hit me that the men and the women paid a heavy price for the freedom for us to sit here and to study God's Word to free Jews who are being persecuted with their very lives by Hitler. There was a price to redeem the time. And so God calls us to invest. He wants us to sacrifice in order to invest. Greater love have no man than this, and he laid down his life, which that memorial so represented. And I thought, where can I choose to lay down my schedule, my agenda, my wants, my desires, so that I can invest to make the most of every opportunity? What about you? Because God has given you everything you have, will you choose to invest it? Will you choose to invest it? Well, look at our second section, because we're going to invest. But we also have studied in, our, in the course of our eight weeks that life is very brief. And so now let's look at how God means for us to choose to enjoy, starting in verse 7. Light is sweet, and it pleases the eye to see the sun. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything to come is meaningless. Be happy, young man, young woman, while you are young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. Well, we're going to look at choosing to enjoy. Letter A, choose to enjoy by rejoicing. Choose to enjoy by rejoicing. Solomon says here, in seven, light is sweet, and it pleases the eye to see the sun. We're rejoicing. He's, in effect, saying we're rejoicing that we, we lived another day. We got to see the sun another day. We, got, we can rejoice over the warmth that the sun provides for the very existence that we have here. So, hey, we can be rejoicing that we celebrate another birthday. Think about that. There are people this year who will not celebrate another birthday. Rejoice 
that your life has continued for another year. Rejoice in light of the fact that death is inevitable. We can rejoice in knowing that, that knowing that God is in control of that. And so we rejoice in the fact that we understand that life is in, in, um, inevitable, death is inevitable. And then he says in nine, rejoice in your youth. Yeah, let me just give you some things that I found as I was working on this. Why rejoice in your youth? Well, because youth have more energy, less responsibility, and less burden. Who can give me a witness? Okay. <laughs> youth see no end to their life. So they desire to experience all life has to offer. And somehow, as we grow up and we age, we get so caught up in living our life that we begin to see it very much like a tunnel vision. We don't have that long range desire of living the life that God has given us. We get caught up in all of those burdens and cares. Youth need to balance enjoyment, though, as he says here, with reverence for God's judgment. Reverence, a respect that God will judge all that we do. So how do we practically apply this? I was thinking about, you know, because our boys are six and eight, and many of you have children, be them grown into adulthood. Some of you have lost children. But the practical application here, if he is saying for the youth to enjoy and to rejoice, well, that means while the children are young, we need to be giving them appropriate boundaries that help teach them a reverence for God's judgment. Not just saying, well, you can do whatever you want. So we want to teach them what that means, a balance, training them up in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they will not depart, understanding they do have that choice providing the boundaries, teaching them the word of God so that the word of God will guide them in their journey. And something that came up at the table where I was sitting, modeling for youth what it means to invest your life, what it means to choose to enjoy. And by the way, if you do not have children, it's okay. There are plenty of children, youth around you in your sphere of influence that God is asking you to model and to provide that example. Well, look at letter B, choose to enjoy by removing. And that sounds odd, choose to enjoy by removing. Look at verse 10. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body for youth and vigor are meaningless. By the way, that word meaningless there, here we, this is another one where that word meaningless means fleeting. So your youth and your vigor are fleeting. It's as though it's a vapor. It will pass away. So we can remove anxiety, banish anxiety. That's referencing the psychological effects of sin in our life. It creates anxiety. It creates issue. And he's saying, remove it. Remove it. There's two ways to think about the removing. First, never engage in the sin that causes the psychological anxiety. That would be one way to keep it removed. Secondly, if we've engaged in sin that's caused anxiety, now we have to go and to replace wrong thinking with truthful thinking through God's word. Philippians 4, verse 4, which says, Be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So we look for scripture that helps us to remove the anxiety that we have in our heart. Or it says, cast off the troubles of your body. Again, there are physical consequences for sin in our life. So we can avoid them totally by making good choices when we are young and growing up, eating the right foods, exercising. If we're already suffering those consequences, then we have to go to the truth of God's word to look for that sustaining power that will help us to cast off those troubles because the body is aging. And that's what leads us to letter C, choose to enjoy by remembering. Choose to enjoy by remembering. Look at um, chapter 12 now. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. 
Let me give you three remembers here as we kind of go through these um, first seven verses of chapter 12. We've got to remember our Creator and what it means to revere God. A healthy respect for a God who created all things, who put them all together, who holds them in place, and then out of our reverence, choosing to keep his laws faithfully and to serve him responsibly. And by the way, remembering was important for the Hebrews. You'll find all throughout the Old Testament ways that they would remember, whether it was building an altar or when they crossed over the Jordan River on dry land, they pulled rocks from the river and they set those up as a remembrance. There were always ways that God was instructing them to remember. We must remember the Creator and revere Him. Secondly, we need to remember God before old age keeps us or hinders us from enjoying Him. Or from enjoying, period. And look at verse 2 where he says, the sun and the light, the moon and the stars grow dark. Here's the idea. Light represents life and darkness represents a, a kind of an impending doom or death, the darkness of death. And so at, before we get there, I see as you age, what he's saying is there's an increasing awareness that death is coming or that death is inevitable. And then, of course, he gives the body aging. So let me just quickly go through. Did you have fun trying to figure out what body parts he was talking about here? We loved this. Okay. Let me just quickly um, go through. When the um, keepers of the house tremble, those are arms and hands, and the strong men stoop, legs. When the grinders cease, that's your teeth. You start losing them as you get older. Those looking through the windows grow dim. Your eyesight is failing. When the doors of the street are closed, look right up here. When you lose your teeth... Your lips kind of curve in. That's, that's, that's what most say that's referencing is the doors of the mouth are closing, that curling in of the lips as you lose the teeth. When the doors to the street are closed, so that the sound of grinding fades, your hearing is going. When men rise up at the sound of birds, you can't sleep as long as you'd like to when you get older. But all their songs grow faint could reference hearing or voice, being able to sing. When men are afraid of heights, and end of the dangers of the street. That's a lack of vigor, or there's a fear, a certain amount of fear um, about the daily living. When the almond tree blossoms, gray hair. The grasshopper drags himself. Think about the grasshopper. And when we think grasshopper, we think quick, jumping, just um, a lot of vitality. So if the grasshopper is dragging, again, that's the opposite view, moving more slowly in our aging and then a, the, and desire is no longer stirred is the diminishing appetite a diminishing appetite whether that be for food for um, physical pleasures but it's a diminishing appetite and then of course then man goes to his eternal home which is death and mourners go about the street so we need to remember God before old age begins to hinder us from enjoying and then, of course, remember God before the body gives out and the spirit returns to God. And if you look there, it says in verse 6, remember him before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well. How fragile, ladies, life is. Think of all of those visual pictures he has given. And we don't have time, but each one of those could represent um, parts of vital organs. That's one, one thing that I found. But again, it's the, fr the fragileness of life. And then verse 7, and the dust returns to the ground it came from. And the spirit, that breath, returns to God who gave it. Remember God before death comes. Now, I want to quickly, before I close out this section, I want you to um, turn back and let me give you a quick synopsis. Remember, I shared with you the six conclusions that Solomon makes in Ecclesiastes. Let's quickly review those. Go back to chapter 2, verse 24, and that's where we're going to find the first conclusion of the six. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This, too, I see is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat and find enjoyment? Flip to um, chapter 3, verse 12. 
where we'll find the second, first part of the second one. Verse 12 says, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is a gift of God. Flip over to the 22nd verse of chapter 3. So I saw there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work. That's part of conclusion number 2. Then turn to chapter 5, verse 18, conclusion number 3. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the days of life God has given him. And then turn to chapter 8, verse 15, conclusion number 4. So I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. Look at chapter 9, verse 7, for conclusion number 5. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favors what you do. And our final one, chapter 11, verse 9, conclusion number 6. Be happy, young man, while you are young, and let your heart give you the joy in the days of your youth. And we were just, just reading that. And as I went back and I reviewed those six truths, it led me, or those six um, actual conclusions, it led me to our second truth. Because as I read them, I realized there was a, a tying theme that God is the giver of enjoyment. And so look at your truth. God gives the gift of enjoyment. God gives the gift of enjoyment. Believers must choose to accept it. God gives the gift of enjoyment. Believers must choose to accept it. And you know what? Accepting it sometimes can be tough. As I talked with Fred last night about this truth, and we, we spoke briefly about where I was going in this section, you know, really what came to my mind as we talked is that, you know, God gives enjoyment. Sometimes we don't like the circumstances in which they are given. And I thought, of course, of Heather, which you've heard so much about in our eight weeks together. Heather would not have chosen the, the path of cancer, the path of death, the path of multiple surgeries, chemotherapy, sickness beyond what I can even imagine. Yet what I saw in her life lived out was a believer who chose to accept God's gift of enjoyment in the days that she had, even though all the circumstances were out of her control. She chose to enjoy. So what about you? Where are you refusing the gift of enjoyment because you don't like the circumstances of the gift? Where are you refusing the gift of enjoyment because you don't like the circumstances? They're not always easy. But one thing I know for sure deep in my soul is that God desires for us to enjoy this life that he has given us. And we've got to choose to enjoy because life is brief, ladies. Life is brief. Let's look at our third and final section. Life is also God-given. We have to choose to obey. Life is God-given. We have to choose to to obey. Look at verse 8. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Where we started, we are now again. The declaration of the teacher that all is meaningless. Look at verse 9. Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. I'm going to pause right there. Choosing to obey means we have to choose to obey, this is letter A, by sharing what you have learned. Choose to obey by sharing what you have learned. Solomon was the teacher. He's the one writing this. 
He took all the wisdom that God had given him and he expressed it to us through many Proverbs. That's, of course, where we get the book of Proverbs. His, the three books attributed to him, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, are considered books of wisdom. And so he shared what God had given him to, with us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit onto the pages of the scripture that we have before us. What are you experiencing right now? This is what I know. Your experience right now, in this moment, today, God has ordained that in your life. And he desires for you to share what he is teaching you with other people. Because there are other people out there that will be able to relate to what you are experiencing right this moment. And so that whole idea, you see those words in verse 9, he pondered and he searched. You'll remember a few weeks ago, I encouraged you, take time to think through a thing. Asking God, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of this circumstance? What are you trying to accomplish in my life? Ponder it. Search it. Ask God to help you to um, make sense of it in a way that you can then go out and share it with someone else. Sharing what God is doing in your life is a powerful way to make God real to other people. So look for opportunities. And by the way, this is what I know. When you choose to share what, what God is doing in your life, it will anchor in your mind truths of God, promises of God. It helps to anchor it. So choose to obey by sharing. Look at letter B. Choose to obey by using wise words. Look at, um, we're going to do 10 through 12 of chapter 12. The teacher searched to find just the right words and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. So we've got to choose to use wise words. So this is what I thought as I read this. Think before you speak. And think before you write. Think before you speak. And think before you write. Because especially, well, if you're like me and you always tend to have to fight that you have something to say, okay? Or if you're texting or emailing and you type very quickly, you need to really be thinking about what you write. So let me give you an acrostic for the word think that was given here at our church many years ago. But we, um, Fred and I have found it very helpful in our daily lives. The T for this acrostic, think. The T stands for true. Are the words I'm getting ready to speak or write true? Is it a truth? Or am I making an assumption? Or am I spreading something that I heard third hand that I do not know for sure that it is true? H stands for helpful. Helpful. That verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads, the firmly embedded nails. Goads were used to herd sheep into the proper, you know, down the proper path, into the proper direction. So your words should be helpful, helpful in guiding and leading other people, moving someone in the right direction. The I stands for inspired. The end of verse 11, given by one shepherd. That is God. Are your words out of the flesh or are your words out of the pages of scripture, which is inspired by God? Or by what you are learning through what God is teaching? Are they inspired or are they just what is coming out of your mouth? And remember, we, we talked last week about gushing folly. We have to be careful and guarded about that. That Psalm 141, put a guard over my mouth. The N stands for necessary. I have really had to work on this and I still come in and out of sometimes saying things that just aren't necessary. Just because I think it doesn't mean that it needs to be said. Sometimes it's just not necessary to open our mouth. And then the K stands for kind. 
You know, and he brings to my mind Ephesians 4, 35, or 32, excuse me. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Are my words kind and compassionate? The word think. So wise people think before they speak and before they write. Wise words also point people to Jesus. Are the words that come out of my mouth or the words that I'm writing, look right up here for a moment. Does it make the person who's been in my presence think of, wow, look at that Elizabeth. Or does it make them leave thinking, wow, God is the answer to my problems. And that's important. Wise words point people to Jesus. Is it about you and what you can offer? Or is it about what God has to offer? So I'm going to encourage you, ladies, that when you are interacting with another woman, and she, because she's your friend, or because for whatever reason she has felt comfortable to lay her burden on you, take the time right then and there to pray for her because this is what happens God does not expect you to have all the answers you can show her though you can point her to the God who has all the answers and there's something amazing that happens in the spirit of someone when you take the time to lift their burden to a Heavenly Father who cares for them? I don't care if you know whether or not they're a believer or not. What's the point? Point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Thirdly, wise, wise words are gleaned from Scripture more than any other book. Wise words are gleaned from Scripture more than any other book. Where does most of your knowledge base come from? Does it come from the pages of God's Word, the giver of all knowledge, the giver of Jesus Christ, who by very nature of His death on the cross and His ascension to the, to the right hand of the Father becomes God's wisdom within us when we choose to accept Him? Is your wisdom coming from the giver of wisdom? Or is it coming from every other self-help book, from every other guru out there that chooses not to look at the Word of God? That's what gets us into trouble. We need to be gleaning wisdom from God's word more. I'm not saying that you can't read anything else. What I'm saying is if you are looking to other things more than God's word, you need to address that before the Lord. Look at letter C. Choose to obey by revering God. And we'll bring this to a close. Now has all been heard. Look at verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Revere, to adore, to highly respect, to worship. So Solomon, after all this looking at life under the sun, comes to the conclusion, I have not been revering God. He has been what is missing in my life. We need to obey by revering God. His conclusion, fear God and keep his commandments. That whole, the phrase, for this is the whole duty of man. Ladies, what he's saying there, look right here. That's the purpose of our lives. Fear God and obey his commands. Fear God, a reverence, an awe, an understanding, like we talked about last week with Isaiah. Woe unto me, for I am undone. So we need to have that reverence for the Lord, and we need to keep that. In. Why, do we, why do we want reverence? Because look at verse 14. God will bring every, underline the word every, deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Mark down Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirits, joints and marrow. <gasps> Listen to this. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. 
Nothing, did you hear that word? Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. And this really struck me. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Our words, our actions, our attitudes, our very thoughts. Even the things that we don't verbalize or act on, they are laid bare before the God who knows all. With that in mind, it should move us to obey by revering God. Out of an overflow of the reverence for him, we wisely choose obedience. And we sang that this morning, trust and obey. I hope that you really think about all of the different, I'm so glad we sang every verse. Trust and obey. Because see, the more we choose to trust God, the more we'll desire to obey God. And the more we actually obey God, the greater our trust in God will grow. They are married together. They go together. And that leads me to our last truth. Greater trust develops when we choose to obey. Greater trust develops when we choose to obey. greater trust when we choose to obey and that is I want to share with you it works well for the um, just kind of illustrating the truth but it also gives me an opportunity to make a request because Fred and I have been on a journey of choosing to trust and obey as it relates to our sharing the principles of God's Word through this love and respect ministry that God has you have to understand ladies Two years ago, that was not even on mine and Fred's radar. We had not thought about it, considered it, and one thing led to another. The Lord has been guiding our step, step by step by step. And so we find ourselves now not only in uh, teaching it here at the church, but we leave at the end of May to head to Cali, Columbia. Now, here's the funny thing about Cali, Columbia. Originally, when God opened this door of doing a foreign mission with the teaching of love and respect in a community that is wrought with divorce, that is wrought with infidelity, that it was going to be one trip in September. That was great. And then in December, we sit down and lo and behold, as we're trusting and obeying each step, the trip goes from one in September. Oh, we're going to do two now, one at the end of May and also one in September. And you know what? We sat right there at the table and agreed to that. And you should laugh because two years ago, we would never have even considered that that is something that God was going to have us do. So my request is that through May 28th through June 1st is our first trip. Pray for Fred and I. Pray for Fred and I as we continue on our journey of trusting and obeying God as it relates to that ministry. So what about you? Where do you need to trust and obey so that you can have a life filled with meaning? Where is God asking you to trust and obey so that you can have a life filled with meaning? How fitting to close our study with these life lessons from Solomon, the man who had all wisdom and chose not to submit to the pruning shears of God. And had a miserable experience in his life under the sun. I don't know about you, but I would like to avoid getting to the later years of my life and characterizing my life as miserable because I chose not to submit to the pruning shears of God, to the removal of the folly that so easily besets us, and realizing that the one key to meaning and purpose in my life is Jesus Christ. And pursuing God more than anyone or anything else meaning depth of meaning because see in John chapter 10 verse 10 Jesus said I come to give you life and life more abundant that's right now ladies that's today that's this moment but what happens is we don't, we don't realize because you you don't hear much of the beginning part of chapter or that verse 10 which says that the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy and then Jesus says, but I come to give you life and life more abundant. We have got to resist that devil stealing and killing and destroying the life that God has for us. So ask yourself, 
in a time that seems to say, keep, 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 will I choose to give, 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 expecting nothing in return? In a time that seems dark and dry and weary, where the body is aging and dying, will I choose to connect to the life source of all time and for all ages? In a time where knowledge is abundant and technology is amazing and God seems unneeded, will I choose to seek him and obey the truth of his word? Because when we survey all that is under the sun with the perspective of all that is above the sun, we will see with God's eyes, his perspective. Seeing through his eyes leads us to making choices that are in accordance to his way, his timing. And in turn, it produces a life of meaning, a life of abundance, a life that is full. A life that overflows, it splashes onto the lives of everyone that God brings in our path. So they're not looking at you, they're looking at Christ in you. And they're saying, I want what you have. That is what God desires for us. And what does that mean? That when death comes, whether I know it or whether it is sudden, I want And I hope that each of you leave here wanting that it will be said of each of us that we made wise choices. Heavenly Father, oh, I praise you because the truth of your word is so powerful. Lord, there are many other things that can change us, but your word transforms When we choose to take it and act on it. And so that is my prayer, my prayer of blessing for each of these women who have sat through this study, even if today is the only day that they have heard, that we each leave here challenged to act in faith, trusting that you will meet us at the point of our discomfort, our emotional pain, our grief, that we act in faith, choosing that you will give us the circumstances that you know are exactly what we need and for your greater glory, choosing to act in faith, allowing you to prune the folly out of our lives, make wise choices so that all those who come in contact with us, they'll have seen Jesus and they'll desire the abundant life that you have given us, life to the full, And Lord, when all is said and done and our life ends, may we have lived a life of wise choices. The same kind of choices that your son Jesus made that led him to a cross to be crucified, died for our sins, rose again, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us right this moment to act. Live it out. We pray it. In his name, the name we revere among every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. 